Thank you very much. Uh, so this is a, a, a lecture series or mini course um, originally supposed to be given by myself and Juliet Bavard uh, jointly. Juliet unfortunately couldn't make it, so uh, it's doubly unfortunate for you because you're going to have to listen to twice as much of me. Um, the mathematics I'm going to be talking about this week, uh, it's a subject that's that's starting to have uh, quite a few people participating in it. So I'm, it's a lot of people have kind of contributed to some of these ideas. Um, but most sort of immediately, the main things I want to talk about, um, the theorems that I talk about when I, when I when I when I'm when I'm when I'm getting to that point, uh, some are due to myself. Um, a lot of them, and a lot of the the most interesting ones, are work of uh, Juliet Bavard, uh, and and also uh, some work of her jointly with uh, Alden Walker. Um, at some point, I'll talk about some stuff that arose from some joint work, also with uh, Jan Mary Hay uh, and Sarah Kirk. But um, so I'm not going to be mentioning who proved what, but or I'll, I'll forget to probably most of the time. But just just be aware, this is not me talking about somehow all my own stuff. This is this is a, a subject with a lot of contributions from many people. Um, all right. So this is a dynamics conference. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, the theory of big mapping class groups. <coughs> And then a little bit about some naturally occurring examples, uh, places in nature where you're forced to think about subgroups of big mapping class groups. Um, and I would sort of characterize there are the examples that are very interesting. And then there's the theory, which in my opinion is also quite interesting. And somehow if this is sort of the examples and this is the theory, both of them have some substance. but they don't quite make contact in the way that I, I ideally hope that they would. So this is this is sort of a subject which is is uh, in its infancy, and I hope that maybe there's um, certainly a lot of more prob more um, questions than uh, answers at this stage. But I hope you'll find it sufficiently intriguing that you'll you'll want to follow up and and think a little bit about some of the questions that come up. Um, so mapping class groups are. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, um, if you look at a group, the group of homeomorphisms of a surface, this is a complicated group as an abstract group, but it sort of also has a topology, say the compact open topology. And instead of dealing with the entire group, um, it's, it's often much more fruitful to deal just with pi zero of this group. So these are called mapping class groups. If I have a surface, I look at homeomorphisms of this surface up to isotopy. Um, and so these are called mapping class groups. And I, so I want today really to focus on a very specific example. Um, so I'm going to let gamma sub squiggle c or just, or just gamma for short, this is going to be the mapping class group of uh, the plane minus a counter set. So this is a surface, the plane minus a counter set. It's one of my favorite surfaces. And you may have a homeomorphism of the plane minus a counter set. And you might really care what happens to sort of the Cantor set. And you might care a little bit about what happens to the plane, but maybe you don't care quite so much about what happens to the plane. You don't only care about, for instance, the isotopy class of this relative, what it's doing to the Cantor set. So this is, I'll just say, pi zero of the group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms. Um, Let's see, of plane minus a counter set. 
So we care what happens to the counter set, the points on the nose, but what happens on the complement only sort of up to isotopy. Um, and so, well, where, why might you care about this group? Um, well, you might have, for instance, a group acting on a surface, leaving invariant a set, and maybe the set that it's leaving invariant is quite complicated, uh, a closed invariant set, that could certainly happen. And so then you could think about, well, what's happening near that set? Maybe one way to understand it is to look sort of topologically at what's happening on the complement of that set. Like how are we sort of moving things around on the complement of that set? So one of the ways in this, this can arise in nature, I could have, for instance, a, si a single homeomorphism, for instance, a homeomorphism of the plane to itself, which leaves invariant some interesting set, say lambda, which might be homeomorphic to a Cantor set, and maybe we could understand the dynamics, some part of the dynamics of phi, well, on lambda or near lambda, and maybe can be understood by considering. Um, the class of phi in the mapping class group, also sometimes written mod, mod of, well, plane minus lambda. So um, in particular, whenever you have uh, a group, and it could just be z, but maybe more generally a group, acting on a surface uh, and leaving invariant some interesting set like a Cantor set, you might naturally get a representation in the group uh, mapping class group of, of a surface minus a counter set. So this can arise often in uh, 2D real dynamics, also in say 1D complex dynamics. Um, the application to 1D complex dynamics is not quite as sort of direct as I'm, I'm suggesting right here, but I'll, I'll come to some examples later on. So, I'll say there's one particularly nice example I'm going to spend at least one lecture, maybe two lectures on, um, the so-called shift locus in complex dynamics. So understanding things like the topology of the Mandelbrot set or analogous sets in high dimensions, we can get some insight into this, the topology of these spaces. Uh, purely by understanding, well, certain subgroups, naturally occurring subgroups of these big mapping class groups. Are we supposed to be thinking that these homeomorphisms extend to the Cantor set? Uh, sure. Yes. So, follow up, do you, do you consider those that cannot be extended to the Cantor Pardon me? Uh, can you allow homeomorphisms that will not be extended to the Cantor set? Um, well, really, I'm just thinking topologically of this Cantor set as a set of topological ends of the surface. So homeomorphisms are going to sort of extend to the space of ends canonically. So the extensions will exist. The quality of them might not be that great, but we're really only caring for the moment about these. So this it extends as a continuous. Extends area? continuously, okay. and maybe, but maybe, but maybe, maybe it came to you in nature from something that was acting in an interesting way, already leaving invariant the counter set. But I don't want to talk so much about the motivation today. I just want to sort of talk about this group um, and to say something, a couple of things about uh, what can be said by, by just sort of uh, uh, direct, directly thinking about this group. So if you have a group um, that arises in nature, the way you understand it is to find some spaces that you understand and uh, think of the way it acts on them. Well, so already this is, this is sort of a group acting by homeomorphisms on a surface, except that we don't have uh, canonical representatives of our ele elements. Our elements are kind of equivalence classes of homeomorphisms, so we don't have uh, a kind of a direct geometric action of the group uh, on a surface, 
But it turns out we can find uh, some natural actions which, which uh, have some nice interesting properties. So I'm going to describe uh, two interesting geometric actions of this group gamma. Um, so roughly speaking, uh, there are, well, there are many different sort of uh, kinds of geometric structures that one wants to consider. Two of the most important are um, hyperbolic geometry and causal geometry. Um, and so, in fact, this group gamma has at least two different uh, lives. One where we think of it as uh, a group of acting in a natural way on a hyperbolic space, and another where it acts in a natural way on a kind of a, a causal space. So I want to describe these two such actions. So I'll say gamma acts, well, faithfully, Uh, on a circle, so gamma can be realized in a quite natural way, and actually more than one way, uh, as a group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms of a circle. So if you don't like the fact that we've kind of quotiented out by uh, isotopy and that we don't have, you prefer honest groups acting honestly on topological spaces, you can study this group uh, completely more or less directly just by looking at how it acts on a circle. Um, it also acts uh, on a uh, very nice delta hyperbolic space. And both of these actions uh, give you ways of thinking about these mapping class groups that are not completely obvious just from the, the definition. So uh, for instance, um, when you have a group that acts on a circle, uh, one way of thinking about that algebraically is you could think of the group itself having a circular order. So you could sort of somehow identify the group with, well, not quite with an, an orbit, but, but morally speaking with, with an orbit. You can put a kind of a, an order on the group, not quite a total order, but a circular order on the group, a sort of a co-cycle, if you like, telling you for each triple of elements whether you have uh, things which are positive or negatively uh, oriented in the circle, clockwise or anti-clockwise in the circle. So when you have a group that acts on a circle, you get a circularly ordered group. Uh, and so in particular, all the subgroups of gamma are um, inherit circular orders from the way in which gamma acts on the circle. In fact, this turns out to be kind of a complete characterization in the abstract of at least the countable groups uh, which appear as subgroups of gamma. So I'll just say, so a partial converse here, gamma a countable group is isomorphic to a subgroup of this mapping class group if and only if G is circularly orderable. So if you are already interested in circularly orderable groups for one reason or another, then this is a slightly different way maybe than you're usually used to of giving a geometric realization of the algebraic property of being circularly orderable. You can, instead of thinking of your group, for instance, just as a group of homeomorphisms of the circle, you could think of it as a group of mapping classes of a uh, surface. And maybe that gives you a different kind of way of thinking about it. Um, on a, when you have a group that acts on a delta hyperbolic space, uh, one of the most interesting and useful applications of this uh, and it doesn't always work, but very often what you can do is to use this action on a hyperbolic space. The hyperbolic space, hyperbolicity is reflected in sometimes in bounded cohomology. When you have a group that acts on a negatively curved space or a delta hyperbolic space, often the, the group uh, just from its action can inherit some interesting classes uh, in bounded cohomology. 
Um, and the most, amongst the most interesting classes are those that arise in very low dimensions. And uh, often what you can do if you have a group that's acting on a delta hyperbolic space, you can use this geometric action to construct functions on your group which are not quite homomorphisms to the real numbers, but say differ by a bounded amount, uh, so-called quasimorphism. So in fact, gamma acting on this delta hyperbolic space, turns out one can use this, can construct, well, infinitely many or uncountably many very interesting functions on gamma. Um, <laughs> these quasimorphisms. I'll, I'll say what these are. But this is just sort of to give you some sense of, of where this lecture uh, series is going. Um, all right, so Maybe it's the wrong way to do things, but anyway. Um, so I want to sort of spend the bulk of today's lecture talking about this uh, second uh, geometric action, the action of this mapping class group of the plane minus a counter set uh, on a specific delta hyperbolic space. Um, so I want to describe this space, define it, talk about some of its geometric properties, why one can see that it's uh, delta hyperbolic, um, and maybe just by seeing that, you'll get some sense of the kind of tools that we can use to study uh, gamma. All right, so now I want to talk about uh, the ray graph. Okay, so gamma here is acting, well, it's not quite acting, but it's almost acting on the plane minus the Cantor set, at least up to isotopy. Um, in particular, any time you can draw an interesting curve in the plane minus the Cantor set, the isotopy class of that curve or the homotopy class of that curve, that's a thing that your group acts on. It gets taken to another curve, and you can consider the action uh, that, this, that this entails. So for mapping class groups, pardon me? For example, but not necessarily. Um, so for instance, so the mapping class group of a surface of finite type, well, any surface, but anyway, one of the main ways in which people study mapping class groups of surfaces of finite type, um, people study the action of a particular complex, really just a graph that carries all the interesting information called the complex of curves. So this is a graph. Um, so I have a surface. So this is a, a, a graph. Um, so this is a graph. So the vertices are, well, isotopy classes of essential simple closed curves on sigma, sigma, and edges are given by pairs with disjoint representatives. So, so there are yeah, so for example, here's a surface of finite type. Here's an essential simple closed curve. Here's another essential simple closed curve. Uh, oops. Here's a third essential simple closed curve. And so in the complex of curves of this surface, uh, these three curves, or the isotopy classes of them, give me three points. So I have the point alpha, 
I have the point beta, I have the point gamma. Alpha is disjoint from beta and it's disjoint from gamma. So there should be a path from alpha to beta and a path from alpha to gamma. Maybe you need to label this. Um, beta and gamma intersect. Um, well, you say, but I thought you said isotopic classes of simple closed curves. These two curves certainly intersect, but maybe by isotoping them, I could arrange for them to be disjoint. It turns out that uh, on a surface, um, there's a way to tell that isotopy classes of representatives are forced to intersect, and that is that we can arrange to have the intersection have the fewest possible intersections, and in order to have the fewest possible intersections, it only has to not allow obvious simplifications. Okay, so it turns out, so what are obvious simplifications? So these are going to be simple closed curves. So the curves themselves are not going to have self-intersections. Um, if I have a configuration of curves on a surface intersecting in some interesting way, um, well, if there's a pair of curves individually intersecting, uh, the, the most complicated intersections that you could have is uh, they could just cross each other at some points. There's sort of exactly one interesting move which changes the numbers of self-intersections if I move these things around and like make sure I'm always in general position. Uh, it's the move which eliminates a bygone or ultimately introduces a bygone. Okay? Um, and it turns out, and there's several different proofs of this fact, one sort of going via hyperbolic geometry maybe is the most direct way to see it. If you have a collection of simple closed curves on a surface, if you have, say two simple closed curves on a surface and you want to know whether they're intersecting in the simplest possible way, then providing there are no bygones, it turns out that the intersection is minimal and there's nothing else you can do. Any other sort of intersection has to be, any other kind of configuration has to have at least as many intersections as that. Uh, in fact, in, in fact, the, 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 in fact, the configuration is sort of unique up to sort of isotopy of the pair. So providing we get rid of bygones by sort of doing these little moves here, um, we can arrange that the intersections when they occur have to occur for topological reasons. All right, so if you've never seen this before, it maybe looks a little bit mysterious, but um, maybe one way to sort of uh, see this geometrically, the configuration, if I pick, a, I say, a hyperbolic structure on, on this surface, then the geodesic representatives of my curves have the least possible number of intersections out of all representatives. So if the geodesics intersect, intersect any representative intersects, and you can tell that we're in the right isotopy class of a geodesic representative exactly by the fact that we don't have these bygones. Okay, so this sort of works when we're dealing about dealing with simple curves or configurations of at most, say, two simple curves. Anyway, we get a thing like this in this particular case. We get, I guess here, uh, beta and gamma are not disjoint. They don't share an edge. So this is a, a, a subset here of the curve graph. And you can do this for any <coughs> surface. Um, so this curve graph always turns out to be a hyperbolic space. Um, so for those of you who don't know what a hyperbolic space is, morally speaking, it means that on the large scale, it's sort of negatively curved. Um, another way of sort of characterizing that is that, well, it's a graph. If we really want to understand its metric geometry, we want to understand the distances between pairs of vertices. The distance between a pair of vertices is the minimum length of a simplicial path from one vertex to another. Really understanding that distance comes down to picking a particular path and knowing whether that path is pretty close to realizing the minimum distance. So a hyperbolic space, morally speaking, is one in which if I draw a path between two GD6, well, maybe there's some obvious thing I can do, like the path goes for a while and it just sort of comes back and I can simplify it in a very obvious way by some very local modification and make it shorter. So a negatively curved space or a delta hyperbolic space is one with the, that property. It says that unless I can simplify my curve by some obvious local move, unless I can simplify some, my path by some obvious local, local move, um, it's necessarily pretty close to realizing the actual distance. 
So distances between points in negatively curved space can be kind of computed efficiently by just drawing any old path joining them and then checking that this path can't be sort of simplified in some, in some kind of simple local way. Knowing that, you know what distances are and that, that lets you sort of understand the metric geometry. So the complex of curves uh, for any surface always turns out to be delta hyperbolic. So as I say, this is going to be synonymous here with negatively curved in the large. Um, but that might not be that interesting. And the reason is, well, on a surface of finite type, this is actually incredibly useful and great and a terrifically uh, cool thing. On a surface of infinite type, the problem is there's so much room, you can always find an essential simple closed curve disjoint from any collection of simple closed curves you might, finite collection you might have drawn. Okay, so the problem is on a surface of infinite type, given a finite collection of essential simple closed curves, alpha 1 up to alpha n, we can always find some beta essential simple closed curve disjoint from them all. And what that means is if I have any collection of vertices in uh, the complex of curves, there's always some other guy which is distance at most one from all of them, which means that any two things were distance at most two. So you get a perfectly nice graph by this construction, and sure enough, it is negatively curved on the large scale. The problem is there is no large scale. It's basically just a point. Okay, it's just a bounded graph. Um, so this is no good. So somehow on a surface of infinite type, there's too much topology, there's too much room for this construction to be that useful. So what we want in order to make this construction work, if we have a surface of infinite type, it might nevertheless be the case that there's some special feature of the surface, topologically speaking, that we can't get away from. Like there's some part of the surface whose topology says that we can't find lots and lots of copies of itself disjoint all over the place. So if you have a surface of infinite type, like the plane minus a counter set, the right way to think of that, or a different way to think of that is that you could think of that as the sphere minus a counter set minus an isolated point. And then the one isolated point is very special, and somehow the topology of interesting curves on the surface that have something to do with that point, the point is special. You can't, there's not sort of enough room on the surface. You can't avoid the point. Okay. So rather than dealing with essential simple closed curves on this surface, we can look here at the plane minus a counter set. We can define what the so called ray graph So this is going to be a graph whose vertices are just going to be proper simple, well, proper rays, proper simple rays, I guess, not intersecting rays, from a point in the counter set to infinity. Okay, so um, it's hard to draw a counter set. So what I'm going to do is, the way I'm going to draw a counter set is little squiggle means counter set. And to sort of emphasize that it's disconnected, usually I'll draw a few little squiggles. So this is a counter set. And here's infinity. So here's the plane minus a counter set, where infinity has been moved so I can actually draw it on the blackboard. And so um, here is a ray from the counter set to infinity, simple ray. So it doesn't intersect itself, proper simple ray. Um, <coughs> here's another one.
Yellow and green probably look kind of quite similar, don't they? Um, so I could have some guy that goes up, does this, comes through here, and does something like that. Okay. So I have three curves here, three proper rays in the counter set. So when I have a ray like this that goes up, appears to crash through this, it's supposed to be a ray, so it it's only has sort of one point on the counter set and the rest is in the complement. You can imagine there's some hole in the counter set that I didn't draw and it's gone through the hole. Okay? You know what? Even if I'd drawn a hole, you couldn't see it from where you were. So imagine that it's there. <laughs> All right? So again, I can draw this. I have three proper rays here, um, and alpha is disjoint from both of them. So I have, this is alpha. So again, I have a picture like I had over there. This is now sitting in the ray graph. Um, and you say, well, fine, but so what? Maybe this ray graph is bounded diameter, maybe it's, who knows what sort of interesting geometric properties it has. Um, so what I want to talk about sort of today is the following uh, theorem, which is due to Juliet Bavard, says that the ray graph is, so, okay, so first of all, it's connected. Graphs which are not connected don't make good metric spaces. Um, second of all, it has uh, infinite diameter. Third of all, it is delta hyperbolic, so it's negatively curved in the large. Um, and fourth of all, there are many elements of the mapping class group of the plane minus a counter set, which act loxodromically on this ray graph. What does loxodromic mean? So here, so to speak, is the ray graph. It's uh, some infinite diameter metric space. To act loxodromically means that there's kind of an axis approximate axis, so phi acts by translation on this axis. So it moves everything in this graph sort of off to infinity in one direction. Um, it's a ne negatively curved spaces have nice boundaries. We could sort of add this boundary at infinity. Uh, this axis is sort of a geodesic axis, a quasi-geodesic axis, limits to one point in infinity in sort of forward time, another point at infinity in backward time, and the action, at least at infinity, has this nice source sync dynamics. Everything except this point gets sort of pushed in forward time eventually into any small neighborhood of this point here. So it's sort of the dynamics is as nice as you like, loxodromic dynamics on a negatively curved space. So somehow there's enough room uh, in this graph for some very interesting dynamics. Um, and one can use this corollary, um, well, not quite immediately, just logically a corollary, but one can use this action, the delta hyperbolicity, in order to construct lots of very interesting functions on the mapping class group, uh, these quasi-morphisms. And I'll get discuss those a little bit in, in, as we get to that point. All right. So I want to prove this. Let's see how much of this we can prove today. Um, the first thing to remark, okay, so connectedness of the ray graph is um, reasonably straightforward. So what do I want to do? Given two rays, I want to find a finite sequence of rays starting at one, ending at the other, which are pairwise, or as we go along the sequence, pairwise disjoint. Okay? So my counter set <coughs> so here's my counter set. Here's infinity. Um, so as a special case, let's consider two rays which are at two different points.
All right, so something like that. All right. So if they at two different points, well, they're non-compact, so I put them in general position. Maybe they intersect actually in infinitely many points. And you say, well, that's an issue, except that um, away from these two endpoints, if they're going to different points in the Cantor set, well, they don't intersect in a little neighborhood of those places. The only place they might intersect infinitely many times is in a neighborhood of infinity. But if we only care about the isotopic class of them, I can make them disjoint in a neighborhood of infinity. So I sort of make them disjoint in a neighborhood of, from infinity. They're disjoint at their endpoints. And then I kind of wiggle them to be in general position. I can certainly assume that they intersect in finitely many points. And then once they intersect in finitely many points, starting at one of them, I can modify it to find something disjoint from alpha, which intersects beta in one fewer point. I basically just do cut and paste. I look at one point of intersection here. Um, at this point of intersection here, I kind of modify this. So if I was looking at, um, well, it's not going to be, this one's not that going to be that difficult. But if, if I sort of, I can start out, roughly speaking, doing what alpha is doing. And then maybe I get to beta, and there's some point here. So then I sort of follow beta. And maybe beta came back and intersected alpha up here a bunch of times or whatever. But I can sort of modify. So I'll just say modify the curve at each crossing, choose a different path at each crossing to produce a new curve which intersects the old curve in one fewer point. Okay, so after finitely many perturbations of this kind, in this case it was just two perturbations or one perturbation, I get a sequence of paths starting at alpha, ending at beta, which has sort of fewer and fewer, uh, which, has, which is pairwise disjoint. Okay, so if I modified at exactly one point, I get a new curve which was disjoint from the old, and by kind of, I don't know, changing the sequence. Is your intention to go around the endpoint and continue along the alpha? Was it my intention to do? Yeah, because now you have changed the, the origin on the counter set from alpha. So it's, it's not connecting the same. But that's fine. The curves don't have to start at the same point on the counter set. What they have to do is these arrays which start at a on, these are rays that go from infinity to a point on the counter set. I said go from a point on the counter set to infinity, but it doesn't really matter which way they go. I, I, I realized that. I wanted to find an example where I eliminated some but not all, but anyway. I'm telling you how to do it. Just go back to, to the point to alpha. Yeah. Go back along beta on the other side of beta. You want me to go this way? No, no, no. No, no you Go around the wiggle on the, the counter set and come back yeah. on the other side of beta. Yeah. Near the first intersection. Is this the first intersection? Yes. Yeah. Okay. What do, I, what do you want me to do here? So you Follow go, the white you go, line. You go back. Follow which line? The white the, to, to the left. This one? The green yes, one? Yes, the, the white. The white. Well, none of them are white. This is green, but. <laughs> okay, so I'm getting different advice here. Uh, Christian's telling me I should go this way. No, no, no. This one. Yes. What's wrong with this? Now you go back. Why do I want to go back? Just go around. What is it? Go turn around and go back. Um, let me let me just point out that this curve gamma, whatever its deficits, it is disjoint from alpha and beta. So it does actually do what I wanted it to do. Um, I think this is actually the curve I wanted. It's just that the example wasn't interesting enough that I had to do more than one thing. OK. Let me just sort of leave this as an exercise if you want to do it yourself. Any two curve, I find maybe the first point of intersection and then choose one of them to continue. I could have started at infinity in, in, as, on the counter set instead of, instead of infinity. I can get a new curve which is disjoint from the curve I started with and has one fewer intersection with the one that I wanted to have fewer intersections with. So I can get a sequence of curves starting at, at uh, alpha, ending at beta, pairwise disjoint. OK, so connectivity is, is sort of um, follows from this picture. All right. 
Um, unbounded diameter, I think, is much more interesting, especially in view of the uh, fact that the curve graph has finite diameter. But actually, it's not, it turns out not to be um, so hard to show. And so one, one way to show unbounded diameter, and this is sort of a, a standard technique in the world of um, mapping class groups of finite type, there's a pretty trick called subsurface projection, which lets you compare complexes associated to curves or rays or whatever it happens to be in two different surfaces. So I have the ray graph. I also have, I'm going to call it Rn. So n is just an integer here. So the ray graph, I'm going to relabel as the ray graph of a Cantor set. I'm going to think of it as one of a class of ray graphs. And I'm going to get such a ray graph really for any compact, totally disconnected subset of the plane. But in particular, I get it for the Cantor set. I also get it for a set with n elements. So what I can do is the following. I can take my Cantor set, and I can think of my Cantor set as n Cantor sets. Here n is 4, let n be 3. So here's my Cantor set. It's also homeomorphic to n copies of the Cantor set. And infinity is here. And what I could do is, I can draw some little blobs around the Cantor set. And now, if I have any ray, what I can do is I can put this ray in minimal position with respect to these curves, the boundaries of the blobs. And then I can replace alpha with the tail of alpha, the last place that alpha leaves one of these blobs and heads off to infinity. And what I can do is I can think of these blobs and crush them to points. And I can replace alpha, this sort of complicated guy here, with, well, maybe still complicated, but a ray now associated to this n element set. OK, so the ray graph R sub n, the definition is the same as the definition of the ray graph of the Cantor set. It's a graph. The vertices are isotopy classes of proper rays from one point in this n element set to infinity. Two guys are joined by an edge if they're represented by disjoint rays. And disjoint, I mean in the complement of these points. They can share an initial point. And of course, they have to share infinity, but they're disjoint in the plane minus this endpoints. OK, so I get a map from the ray graph of the Cantor set to the ray graph of the n element set. And the nice thing about this is this map, it's a simplicial map. It takes rays to rays, it takes vertices to vertices. The edges here are pairs of rays that have disjoint representatives. Well, if I have a pair of rays, alpha and beta, which are disjoint, when I cut them off at some point, I get subsets of them. They're still disjoint. Okay? So it takes disjoint guys to disjoint guys, maybe the same guy. They might become isotopic after I do that. That's fine. So it either takes two points which bound an edge to two points which bound an edge or to the same point, maybe. In particular, there's a simplicial map. So this map is simplicial. And hence, one Lipschitz. Um, and by the way, there's certainly lots of sections. Given a ray here, I can certainly find some ray here which map to it. So the map is certainly surjective. So it's simplicial. It's one Lipschitz, certainly surjective. In particular, to show that the ray graph has unbounded diameter, I only need to show that one of these guys has unbounded diameter. So very simple. So example of R3, 
this guy here I claim this guy here has unbounded diameter. In fact, I can tell you more or less exactly what the ray graph is in this case. Um, supposing I have a proper ray from a point in this three element set to infinity, an isotopic class of proper ray, well I can think of the plane minus three points or the sphere minus three, minus uh, four points, or I can think of the sphere with four mark points if you like, I can take a double branch cover and I get a torus and there's sort of four marked points on the torus, one of which is uh, corresponds to infinity and the other three correspond to these three marked points. And then the curve, the pre-image of this curve, when I take the double branch cover, it was a ray here, it's going to give me a simple closed curve here. So this, this quotient map here this is a map from the torus to the plane with sort of four mark, or the sphere with four mark points. This is the quotient under this involution which just rotates by pi around this axis. Okay. So I mean here's one of the pre-images of this curve, then the other one is somehow on the back, something like that, so like a dotted line. But I get a simple closed curve. So given a ray here, I get a simple closed curve here, not an arbitrary one, but one invariant under this involution. Okay. Um, and if I have two guys here which are disjoint, then over here the curves I get, well they're not quite going to be disjoint because after all they're both going to intersect infinity, but they're going to have at most one or two points of intersection. Okay. If this guy here was the same point as that, they'd have two points of intersection. If it's different, then they have one point of intersection. So looking at rays in the ray graph uh, R3 is more or less the same thing as looking at simple closed curves on the torus and having them be disjoint is more or less the same as having them intersect, oh I want them to go through this point here infinity, having them intersect uh, sorry, having them be disjoint here is more or less the same as having them intersect at most two, two times. So simple closed curves on the torus are in bijection with uh, rational numbers, union infinity, right? Because they're just given by the meridian and the longitude which have to be co-prime. Okay? So the simple closed curves, essential simple closed curves on the torus, it's basically the same thing as the rational numbers, union infinity, and so there's this, uh, the graph that you get here, it's very closely related to the, the so-called uh, fairy graph, which is you'd start drawing this graph, zero, infinity, one, minus one, um, a half, two, et cetera. So you kind of, it's this dyadic tree, basically. Well, it's not quite a dyadic tree. It's kind of the dual to this dyadic tree, but it's this graph, okay? So this graph here, the one skeleton of this triangulation, uh, it's quasi-isometric to this ray graph R3. So R3 is basically the one skeleton of this fairy triangulation. Um, and diameter is unbounded in this graph. Basically, uh, the distance from let's say zero to p over q is really just the number of terms in the continued fraction expansion of p over q. So since that's unbounded, the diameter here is unbounded, and since we had a one Lipschitz map from this space to this space, which is surjective, this guy must also be unbounded. Okay? But beyond the unboundedness, let me say that this at least tells you you can sort of explore the geometry um, in this ray graph of the Cadder set by understanding the geometry in ray graphs associated to surfaces of finite type. So if you already understand these, and there's a huge amount of literature devoted to understanding sort of ray graphs and associated curve graphs of, you know, plane minus finite numbers of points, using that you can say a lot about the geometry in um, RC. So any finite configuration that can occur in any sort of finite geometrical object that can occur in some Rn will also occur in the Cantor ray graph. 
and conversely. So understanding, so to speak, the finite subsets, the geometry of finite subsets of this space is the same as understanding the geometry of finite subsets of these spaces for arbitrary n. All right. Uh, I feel like I'm out of time. So what I'm going to do is stop. All right. <laughs>